So I want to invite you one more time to stand. And if you've got a copy of God's Word, there are some in, on the ground around you or a device. Go to that wonderful book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, I'm going to read beginning in verse 9 through the end of the chapter there, verse 17. It says, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we are always humbled by your word and your redemption story and that we, as we gather as your church, that we have this picture to long towards and, and Father, by faith believe in that our destination is this ultimate picture of beauty, worship, that in as much as these incredible words communicate to us, we can't even scratch the surface of understanding of what that day will be. So Father, today as we celebrate you, Father, we don't gather today celebrating a church or something a church has done, but we gather today celebrating you because you are the only reason that we exist Your provision, your work, your grace, your mercy. And so, Father, today as we gather again, would you speak to us? Would you move in our hearts? Do a work of transformation in us today. That's in your amazing name that we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. A story that's become a bit iconic in the life of our church, I want to tell again today, just a reminder, a recentering maybe, and for some of you in here, you haven't heard it before, you, maybe you've come within the past year to Crossings Community Church, and it was a day, I believe it was my son's birthday, my memory uh, on these details aren't fantastic, my son's birthday, he probably would have been somewhere around age three or four I believe. We were living at a previous house, and so what we did is we just invited everybody over to the park behind our house to celebrate his birthday party. And so there were kids around there running around, kids his age, and at that park was an old, red, rusty merry-go-round. Now, something's happened in history. I don't know what it is. I can only assume that merry-go-rounds have been the cause of a lot of lawsuits because they're not being constructed anymore at new parks. Well, this neighborhood that we lived in um, was 
over 20 years old, and I think this particular merry-go-round had been there that long. And we were there, we're playing, all the kids are running around, they're doing their thing, and some of them are on the merry-go-round. And so, you know, parents, the obvious question, right? Push me, push me, push me. Okay, so I'm there, and I'm pushing, and I'm pushing, and, and, and you know what they're saying, right? Faster, faster, faster. And so I'm just pushing that thing as fast as I possibly can. And I'm sure you can picture in your mind what's going on with them, right? They're, they're there, and some of them are in the middle, but the faster that it goes, the more, the more towards the edge they get, right? They're holding on, and then the ones at the, the very edge of it, the, they're holding on to the end of that pole with their feet on it, and their bodies are getting extended, right? Because I'm pushing it just as fast as I can. And that force of that merry-go-round spinning around sends them one by one tumbling off across the mulch that was at the floor of that playground. Now, first instinct, of course, is to get a little worried because I'm spinning other parents' children off of that merry-go-round. But, but you know what happened was that's when the laughter began to happen. That's when it became fun. That's when it became fun. You see, they liked the part of spinning, but the ultimate fun was when they were sent off tumbling across the ground. That's when they, and, and that's when not only are they laughing and they're having fun, but the other kids that were looking from afar and they're evaluating, they weren't the early adopters, right, of this whole experiment. They were going to wait and see how this went. They see their friends tumbling off in laughter, and that's the moment they say, we want to get on. We want to do that too. So it was that day that I was sitting there and reflecting on that, that as I've shared many times before, God just had a connect the dots moment for me. Looking at Crossings Community Church and where we are and just kind of the picture and the vision that he had given, and it wasn't a, a new vision, it didn't change the vision at all, but it was rather a metaphor that brought life to the vision that he had given. And that is as a church, when we say that we've been called to literally, if you read our vision statement, impact the world, that that happens as we engage, equip, and empower homes for gospel transformation. And so as these kids were spinning on the merry-go-round, it was like this, this work, this force that was, that was working on them, and this force was pushing them out. And that same force, the faster and faster that that merry-go-round would go, they would get spun off out there in complete joy and laughter with the other kids wanting to hop on. And so as we look at this picture of the church that God's given here for us, Crossings Community Church, he's called us to be a church that equips, that, that our lives on this merry-go-round, we're spinning round and round as we come together and we worship together, and our lives are being changed by the realities of the gospel. Every single Sunday as we open his word, just like we are today, and we look at his word and we cry out, desiring for more of him and less of us. We're being changed transformed. And that work of transformation, we can't stay on the merry-go-round. You see, that's the difference, right? Merry-go-round and carousel. If you've seen a carousel before, I don't think those have been outlawed yet. You go and you can get on them. There, I think there's still one at Memorial City Mall, a really nice one. There used to be anyway. You go and the whole point of that carousel is to sit on a beautiful horse or chariot, whatever they are, and ride have fun and sit there until your money runs out and the ride's over, right? There's a drastic difference between a carousel and a merry-go-round. God has called Crossings Community Church to be a merry-go-round. This isn't a place where you come and sit and you enjoy this beautiful, ornate picture of all these amenities and, and, and you just kind of come and you ride and you, you stay on until literally the money runs out. But rather, it's a place where God does an amazing work of transformation in homes, and that amazing work of transformation in homes propels those homes outward as disciples of Jesus Christ. Outward into a community, impacting the world, right? Which is the vision that he gave some 12 years ago. And so as we begin today and we look, there's been this undercurrent theme each week of this series that we've wrestled with, and I've tried to trickle it through every Sunday, and that is the why aspect of all the things that we do. 
And so today, as we finish that series here with Legacy Sunday, I, I want to again look at a why. And what, be- what better picture of why than looking at this ultimate end in Revelation chapter 7. So we read again the beginning of that, and John, of course, reflecting on this vision, I just let you know a side note here. I've had two books, some of you have heard me say this before, on my bucket list to preach through from beginning to end. One was Romans, and the second was Revelation. I've done Romans, so that's fair warning. We're coming to Revelation at some point. I don't know when, but we're coming. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. This is a picture of the gathered church, right? All of those who have been redeemed, all of those who have been, as we read, washed by the blood of Jesus. And this picture that John is seeing and that he's describing for us is it's a multitude so great you cannot possibly put a quantitative number on it. It's enormous. It's huge. It's complete. I think the picture that he's trying to communicate to us and God as well is that grace, the grace and mercy of God here is incalculable because that's the source of this group, right? It's by the grace of God this group has gathered. By the mercy of God this group is here and this group cannot be measured because neither can the grace and mercy of God. And this group, as you begin to see it through John's eyes from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Think about that for a minute. I've wrongly heard people before talk about this destination of heaven or when, when we get to this ultimate eternal end and, and that there will essentially be no differences all of, all of the differences between us that exist today that cause tension will no longer be. Now, granted, sin will be no more, but I believe the full beauty of God's creation will not end. That's what we're seeing here. There will still be, from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and all languages here, the beauty of this moment is that there's harmony amidst the diversity. That's what we don't see around us today. That's the difference between this glorious moment of heaven and the sinful world that we exist in today is we have diversity, but we have no harmony whatsoever. At the feet of the Lamb, we will have the ultimate beauty because of the harmony that exists between every nation all tribes, all people, and all languages. And the unifying factor here, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. What what do they have in common? Well, two things, but the first we just read, one is they're clothed in white. Everything else about them may be different. They may be from the completely different parts of the globe, speaking completely different dialects. Every skin color imaginable, but the joy of this moment is inexpressible. Ultimate harmony amidst the ultimate of diversity with the commonality being the white robes and then, of course, the activity of what they're doing. So with palm branches in their hands, and that's simply the symbol that we see throughout Scripture, right, of God's provision. You remember the triumphal entry? They had palm branches. The Feast of Booths as well, as you look back, it it was palm branches associated with that, which was um, God's provision of the promised land for the nation of Israel. So it's a symbol of God's provision here. And so what has God provided that they've got these palm branches And it says in verse 10, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God. So the unifying factor here with every nation, every tribe, every language is that they've all gathered together in white robes in complete harmony, worshiping the God of the universe and directing their adoration towards his provision of salvation. Salvation belongs to our God. Why are they singing that? Why that phrase amidst all the other phrases? I mean, we see in other moments in the book of Revelation, worthy, worthy, worthy. That's a great worship song because he is worthy. 
But why here salvation belongs to our God? Well, as they gather amidst this diverse group of people, every people, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, they're rejoicing, they're worshiping in the fact that they're right there in this moment and they did nothing to deserve it. They did nothing to deserve it. Salvation, it belongs to God. He did this in me. I could never have accomplished this. I was not good enough. I was a sinner, a wicked person. I didn't do anything that earned the right for me to stand here today and be amidst this beautiful picture of harmony, amidst diversity, and yet a, yet a continuity of worship directed to a holy God. I did nothing to deserve this. Salvation, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So this worship that's going on here in this picture, I hope in some way, I would love to be able to see, this would be a really cruel trick to have all the time, but just this morning, I would love to see little projectors coming out of your head to see what you're picturing in this moment. We wouldn't want to walk around with that 24-7, but here this morning, I think it would be cool. How do you see this picture that John is painting? Well, let me add to the picture, right? You've got diversity, harmony, and worship. They're all responding to God for who he is, and that causes something to happen. Verse 11. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they then fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Notice the order of what happens here. The church people of God who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, their worship is so infectious and contagious that the heavenly host then responds to their worship and begins worshiping. What an amazing sight that is. Salvation belongs to our God as they're, as they're heralding that in worship, and the heavenly host begins to worship as well. And, and we see there in verse 12 how they begin to Accompany that worship. Or they sang blessing and glory. Seven things. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful picture. Then one of the elders addressed me, John, saying, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And he answers them, sir, you know. You know the answer to the question you're asking me, in other words. And so he says, gives him the answer. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you hear the question that's being asked here. Who are these people that are participating in the most beautiful moment that anyone could ever imagine? He's saying these, these people that you see here, they are the ones who, whose lives and whose, whose robes were stained with sin. Their lives were sa stained with sin and, and yet by faith, by believing in Jesus, the blood of Christ washed clean their robes. By placing their faith in him, all of the stains that existed on their robes, all of the blackness that covered them, because of the bloodshed of the lamb, they were washed clean by their faith alone. And that is the only reason that they are gathered here in this moment, the most beautiful moment of history worshiping because of the blood of Jesus. And so we get an explanation here. I'll read these last verses. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor scorching heat, for the Lamb 
In the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I want to flip just a couple pages real quick and show you the other spot that the same verbiage is used. Real quick, this is Revelation chapter 21. I love this picture. Verse 4, again, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Former things have passed away. Can you imagine the beauty of this moment? All of the hurt of the world is gone. It's no more. All of the pain and suffering of the world, it's gone. It's no more. All of the disabilities are gone. All of the broken hearts, the pain and suffering, the emotional pain and suffering, the mental pain and suffering is no more. And yet the fullness of the glory of God is on display. What a beautiful moment. Back when we lived in that house with the old park and the old merry-go-round, we had a neighbor across the street, not directly across the street, but catty corner, and he was a neighbor of the best kind. He was the kind that liked to bring food to us. He uh, was a fantastic barbecuer, um, and uh, he often went and he entered different competitions and stuff. And so he brought us all kinds of stuff. He was a great guy. But he wasn't just about uh, barbecuing. He was also just a general foodie all around. His name is Drew. And some years ago, after we moved and we left, he started this Facebook page, a group. And he called it Katie Fort Bend Foodies. He started it because he loved food, and he was a foodie, and he wanted to tell other people about it. Well, today, I looked just a couple days ago, and there's some 34,000 members of that group that he started just because he's passionate. He likes to talk about food. It's interesting when you really begin to think about the way we're wired. Things that we value come out of us, right? Things that we find beautiful, things that blow our mind, experiences that we have that we believe are are just incredible. We talk about them. We we share them with others around us. So each week as as we've journeyed through this series, we've looked and we said that we see a people at Crossings Community Church, a people who are the aroma of Christ's victory to the people around us. That, that, that we're so filled with, with the victory and the gospel of Jesus being transformed by it that it can't help but seep out of us. And then the next week we said we see a people equipped and empowered for engagement. That, that we see a people that as we gather together as a church, that, that everything we do from Sunday morning all the way through our children's area to small groups, we're, we're equipped, we're, we're trained, we're fed with the word of God amidst real relationships. And then postured for engagement from James chapter 2, right? The disciple, real faith produces action. We see a people equipped for engagement. And then last Sunday, we talked about being a transforming people. We see a transforming people who are infectious to the world around them. In other words, you and I, as we gather here, we don't have it all figured out. Not a single one of us in this room is living the perfect life. Every one of us is all messed up every way up, down, right, and left. That's just the truth of the way it is. But every one of us, if we've placed our faith in Jesus and we've come and we're we're interacting with his word, we're being transformed by him. His grace is working in us and all of those rough edges and struggles in our life, he's working on. And so as we talked about it last week, we said at Crossings Community Church, we see a transforming people who are then infectious to the world around them. And today, just in summary of all of those ideas... Crossings Community Church, we see a legacy of transformation. 
legacy of transformation. And, and I, I want to step back for a minute and just make sure we understand that word, even though we use it all the time here at Crossings. You see, Paul talks about this idea of being saved, working out your salvation. So all of us in here, we, transformation includes that l- from darkness to light moment. In other words, somebody comes to our door and they come in here because you, any one of you in your homes had built a relationship with them, but their life has never truly been submitted to following the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they come in here and they hear the gospel and they say, yes, that's the hope that I want to have that's bigger than the circumstances I face. And, and to be able to stop trying to be good enough, but just put my faith in Jesus. Yes, I want that. That's transformation. And for the others that come in here, like many of you, where you walk in and you say, well, I remember a day where my relationship with Jesus began, but, but now I'm kind of down the road and my life looks different. But yet every single step of the way is a journey deeper into knowing him. It's the journey of transformation. A legacy of transformation. We see a church and a people with a legacy of transformation. That's why we do what we do. We see lives transformed, not only locally here, around our city, but literally around the world, seeing lives changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our why. That's why for the past 12 years, we've sent teams, multiple teams, to the Philippines Teams that went over to the Philippines and were involved in planting churches there, training church planters. We actually built a facility so that they could go to school and learn how to plant churches and then go out and be involved in church planting while teaching people how to farm. That's a legacy of transformation that God worked through Crossings Community Church. Taking multiple trips to Cuba and being involved there with, with relationships and seeing, seeing young people and older people hear the gospel for the first time and seeing churches that are planted amidst the most evil circumstances, seeing them find the hope of the gospel there. That's why a legacy of transformation. Our why we've prayed for and sent out Families from our midst. We've seen our own church member families pack up their things, sell what they couldn't pack up, and move to Uganda, move to Guatemala, move to Tanzania. I want to read to you. I received this just a couple days ago. I thought, how appropriate. This is from Darren and Mary Beth. In Arusha, Tanzania, Darren writes, first, let me just say how much we miss all of you. Life has been crazy here, but it feels, I can't read his writing, (laughs) but it feels good, I think, is what he says here, to be in our new home. We will always have a longing to be with you, our church home. Thank you so much for your financial and spiritual support. We would not be here at all if it were not for crossings. Thank you for all of your love and your encouragement over the years. Thank you for all that you've done to make Christ look beautiful in Katy and around the world. Why we do what we do. Our vision statement that we might have an impact Around the world, see homes transformed around the world and and somebody might hear that, they might walk in from the outside and they may look around the room and they say, look here, there's not enough people in this room to, to have any kind of global impact. And I would say to them, sit down and let me tell you some stories. Let me tell you stories about not only those from within who we've actually seen move out and go, but I can also tell you a story of another family that church members of ours who lived in East Asia for over a decade taking the gospel to a people who had no idea what the cross and resurrection of Jesus was and stayed there until the last minute when they literally couldn't stay any longer. A legacy of transformation 
That's who God's called us to be. That's, that's why we do what we do. And when we gather here on Sunday morning, as we've highlighted each week, when we, when we have our kids up there, upstairs, and with the changes we just made recently, that they might have fun and learn to worship and yet hear biblical teaching, the idea is that God might do a work of transformation in them. In our groups, a work of transformation in them. Everything we do. And so this idea, I'm sure many of you have heard, popularized by Stephen Covey. His book, Seven, Seven Effective Traits of Highly Effective People, something like that. Obviously, it's not on my bookshelf. But I'm familiar with this one of the seven. And that is begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. But it's interesting when you hear the way he unwraps that. He takes you into this funeral setting. Some of you have read the book, I'm sure. He takes you in when he's talking about beginning with the end end in mind. And he takes you and he walks you into a room. And he describes, you know, picture in your mind that people are wearing black. And and people are crying. and, And you're in a funeral. And then you look in the casket and it's you. And then he asks the question, what, who would be in the room around you? What would they be saying? I think he's got an important idea there, begin with the end in mind. But you know, it's not original to Stephen Covey. There's an idea here in the Bible I'll read to you. It's Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 35, he says, Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. You see, that is exists today with the end in mind. Be ready, be dressed for action, for at any moment Messiah Jesus may return, and at any moment we may find ourselves at that moment of glory, surrounded by the multitude of diverse and yet beautiful worshipers of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Live today with the end in mind. And so... The question is, what what does that look like for you? What what does it look like for you? What does it look like for us as a church to exist that way? When you think about that moment and you look around, how does it change the way you pray? Maybe you hear that and you picture it and you're crying out to God saying, God, give me the opportunity to communicate the beauty of your gospel with this individual and this family member, this person that's in my life. Maybe it changes the way you think about his church and the mission of his church. All of these things that God has done as we look back over these years, literally around the world, in this community, in Katy, let me ask you a question. We've, we've been able for the past two years to work towards planting a church from within. Now, we've been involved in our 12-year history of collaborating, and I I tried to tally it up this week. With collaborating, we've been involved in at least 10 other church plants around our city. That's amazing. But for the first time, we've been working towards sending our own out, our own staff member out to plant a church, and we expect by the end of January that they will begin meeting publicly in Jane Long Elementary in Richmond. How amazing is that? A legacy of transformation. Not only here, not because of our brand, not because we're called Crossings Community Church. That'll be Renaissance Church, and we pray for them that they will have a legacy of transformation around the world, a legacy of transformation. And all of this... All of this God has done without us having a facility to call our own, right? We've met in schools. We began at Kilpatrick. We, sorry, we began at McMeans Junior High. And then we went to Kilpatrick. And then Seven Lakes Junior High. And then Seven Lakes High School. And then today here at Tompkins High School, which, by the way, we were on the waiting list to meet here since before construction was finished at the school. All of these things that God's done in our midst and through us, 
with no facility to call home. What, what if? What would it look like? What if we had a place, a meeting place? What if we actually had a spot where we were able to equip and empower church planters to go out and their team and and space to be able to gather them and to be able to love on them and encourage them? What if we had a space to be able to bring in missionaries and be able to have conversations of encouragement and support? What if the merry-go-round of transformation actually had a home and we were able to use that as as a... gift to the community at large, that they looked at that and they saw, you know what, we can go there and, and we, can, we can spend time there and we can, we can go and that's for us. That's not something that just takes away and causes traffic jams, but rather it's a place that's valuable to the community. What if, what might God do if he's done all of this without it? I want to extend an invitation to you as we close. What does this mean to you? Are you willing to engage in God's story on this merry-go-round? And if you think, Matt, that's a huge question. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Everything. Financially, yes, of course. But we don't like to talk about that. That's fine, I, I do. <laughs> Financially, absolutely. God's going to provide that permanent facility home for us because of the faithful givers that have already, over the past 18 months, given abundantly. What an amazing testimony to your faithfulness and an amazing God. But that's going to continue. That's how he's going to work to provide that. The only way we've been able to leverage funds towards planting this church is because of the faithful givers that exist here. So yes, are you willing to hop on this work of God's story on the merry-go-round to create this legacy of transformation financially? That's part of it. The other part is with time, with effort, with prayer, with service, and with action you're willing to go out and be the kind of disciples that we find week in and week out that the scripture calls us to be? Are you willing to hop on God's story at this merry-go-round? And what does that look like for your home? As we pray this morning and our worship team comes up, they're going to begin to play and we're going to worship And I pray that we worship as close as we possibly can to that beautiful moment that we just read about. But I want to give you some time to just reflect on that question. What does it look like for you to hop on God's story on that merry-go-round? Father, we need you and we confess that everything about Crossings Community Church is all about you. It's your grace, it's your provision, it's your miraculous work, it's your endurance, it's your faithfulness. It's because you are all powerful, you are mighty. God, we give all blessing, all thanksgiving, all glory and honor and might to you. Because salvation belongs to you. Father, we we worship in agreement with the gathered church at the end in eternity, Father. And we we exclaim today, salvation belongs to you. No one else. Salvation belongs to you. Now, Father, would you show us how you want to use us? How might we be tools of that salvation story? How might we be tools of a legacy of transformation here, not only in our city, but in Richmond, around the Houston Metroplex, around our nation, and around the world. We ask for your calling on our homes. We ask for your provision for your church. And Father, most importantly, We worship you. We worship you united this morning. We worship you united in proclamation of your work of salvation.